Today I have a talk that has two titles. The first title is really just an acknowledgement of a person who has made my career and my life better for having existed. That person is my father. My father was Professor John Bollard. He uh, was a rocket scientist. Yes, my dad was a rocket scientist. He was born in a very small farm near Mount Parangia. Um, I'm a fifth generation Kiwi with an American accent because my dad didn't have a career in rocket science in New Zealand. He had to go to the States. So I was born in Seattle. And by the time I was born, he was the head of the aeronautical engineering department at the University of Washington. So I grew up with a dad who constantly looked up at the sky at night. And my childhood was surrounded by watching those satellites move across the sky. And I was fascinated. So the title, To Infinity and Beyond, is really what my dad was looking at. He was looking upward, whereas I was looking at those satellites thinking, hey, that's really interesting. And actually, I want to find out what's on those things. So, just to acknowledge my dad again and thank him for the role that he played in my life and in my career. So, me. This is the second half of the title. Uh, fly above to see below. So, yes, I was fascinated in satellites and excited by them and thrilled by them. And my dad really wanted me to be a doctor. He wanted me to be a doctor of medicine. So, I went to this university in America where I studied pre-medical sciences and did a lot of physiology, studied a lot of human biology, and spent my life dreaming of being a doctor, but still looking at the sky every night, wondering what those satellites were looking at, and fascinated by that. When I was an undergraduate at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, not Australia, but Walla Walla, Washington, I did a project at the end of my degree, and it was similar to our last project that we do in our undergraduate in sciences. And this project was understanding diatoms and how they produced energy through photosynthesis. So I loved it and was inspired by it. And my dad kept saying, but it has nothing to do with medicine. I was like, yeah, I know. But I got very lucky and I won a scholarship at the end of my degree because of this research and because I published from my undergraduate project. I won the scholarship with the Jet Propulsion Lab. And it was a partnership between the University of Washington at the Marine Lab and the Jet Propulsion Lab. And it was to study primary productivity of diatoms from space. So this is where I did my field work. And this is where I grew up in Washington State on Puget Sound. And I loved it. It was so exciting. And my dad could just see the medicine disappearing from my eyes. I loved it so much, and while I was out there, I got to experience how do we use satellites? How do satellites actually capture that imagery? How do we understand productivity of phytoplankton? And it was really, really exciting. But while I was out there, I also got to see these guys a lot, a lot of them. There were some really exciting moments where the orca surfaced around us. We were in the middle of nowhere on a boat, and they were orca breathing, and it just blew my mind. At the same time, though, it was when SeaWorld were capturing orca for captivity. And it, that was awful, to watch those orca being captured and transported in sea cages with their family, their fano, around them crying. And you could hear the sounds of them being taken from their family. And you could feel the suffering. So that is where the conservationist in me was born. And I realized I need to do a bit more than study medicine. And then I went and you know, did some volunteer work at a hospital and realized that was just not for me. <laughs> I went underwater. I spent about eight years of my life scuba diving. I worked on the Great Barrier Reef after I completed my master's degree from the University of Auckland, where I studied fish physiology. I did thousands of dives. I have spent a lot of time underwater connecting with the animals that live under there. I decided after I did my master's degree that physiology was not something I wanted to do for a career. I had to kill too many fish, and I just so enjoyed these sorts of environments where I could actually study them in their natural habitat. So I went into conservation and did my PhD as, um, at James Cook University, as you mentioned, on the Great Barrier Reef. And I looked at how we conserve spaces. How do we, as humans, use the environment that we work in? I studied dugongs 
dugongs with this amazing woman called Helene Marsh, who is still my mentor and has only just retired and become an emeritus professor. She inspired me to look beyond just swimming with the fish, but looking at patterns and looking not just at patterns locally, but globally. So she's really the person who also, apart from my dad, inspired me on my journey. So there is a reason why I'm telling you about my journey. I'm trying to connect those dots. <laughs> so I discovered drones. We used to fly in those tiny airplanes that were on the last slide. These are not the drones that I use. These are the military drones. I like drones that study the environment. The problem with studying animals from space is it's, the satellites are just a little bit too far away and you have to correct for all the atmosphere. But with drones, I can study patterns that are on a more local scale. Patterns, well, I can look at animals, I can study patterns in around five or 600 hectares. And that's really where my career has taken off and AUT has enabled that career. And a lot of my, sign, my students and my postgraduate students work in this space, trying to understand those spatial patterns. Looking at drones, I, I love this graph because it really tells you that this is a new and emerging technology. And I have been incredibly lucky here at AUT to have been supported in developing this technology and working across faculties to develop it. We're really at the beginning of what these things can do for us. And we're at the beginning of how we can all work together to make it happen. This is us in Antarctica. Yes, I do work in Antarctica. I won an Anzari grant, which is a prestigious grant to actually do and conduct research in Antarctica. And I took my PhD student with me. So as you can see here, I think this was my PhD student, Rebecca Jarvis. I took the head of school because that way I got to boss him around instead of him bossing me around. I was the smallest person there was the expedition leader. And we had a great time and did some incredible work that has really transformed the way that Antarctica New Zealand does environmental management. This is just to give you a glimpse. It's cold. It was minus 20 at the time. This is us launching the drone over an area that's a protected area. So this area is around 200 hectares in size. And it is protected because on it there is a historic hut. And it's Scott's hut. That hut was built in 1911 for the Scott expedition. And Scott left the hut. He went inland to find the South Pole. He found it. Unfortunately, he was second for him. And he never made it back again, so he died. But the hut was left in its state. And it's an incredible thing to witness and experience. But I was also interested in what was around there. And you can see these ponds that are full of cyanobacteria. I'm just letting you know what it's like to fly inside a drone, not that I've been inside of it. But you can hear it taking photographs. So what that drone does is take thousands of photographs. We then stitch those photographs to together to create 3D models of the landscape. Those models can become maps. Those maps can be used for management planning. What we were interested in was the human impacts. And that's basically the walking trails. Where were those people walking? We needed to look at that human impact because the Antarctica New Zealand wanted to record exactly how many footprints were on that landscape. That's a lot of footprints. And we added to those footprints. As you can see, this is the hut itself. You can see the trail on the, on the right hand side, on the downhill side is sort of the water. The human footprint is the one that goes across the landscape. Those lines coming up are actually footprints from seals. They come up out of the water and they climb up into the snow and, and lie on the hot rocks. Hot being, you know, not, not minus 20. So it was pretty impressive. You can see AUT branding in Antarctica. It doesn't happen very often, but it is part of our model. <laughs> we have a, grand, a ground sheet that we fly with and, and it actually has AUT on it. <laughs> it helps us to geocorrect. We also went inside the hut. This was our first example of taking photographs of an interior space. And this is um, just the point cloud. So these are points that are generated by stitching those images together. It's very, very rough. What you're going to see in the coming months is something else that we have done where we have done the same sort of thing but with LiDAR scanning inside Sir Edmund Hillary's hut. And we've generated an entire virtual reality game. And that's been in partnership with Art and Design a fantastic and exciting project that's coming out very soon. 
Another project that we've done is a lot of flying around New Zealand, mapping these beautiful landscapes here. We have so much to be grateful for. We fly this big fixed wing drone. That's what it looks like from the ground, not in the air like you had last time. Uh, we take thousands of photographs, and as you can see, we stitch those photographs together to create these 3D maps or these 3D models. Those models can then be used in other ways, such as for understanding the science of the area, for understanding the species distribution, for looking at height and contours. Um, and this is just going to dive down into that gorge. So we've created this, this map itself. This is showing you the height. Um, we had terrible models previously of this area that were taken from space. And so by flying a drone, we could create really good models to help us understand where it was safe to fly and where we might have to worry about cliffs. And finally, I was going to talk to you about Namibia. Namibia is another area that I work in. And again, we take students. And we work with local students. I do a lot of work with indigenous communities in Australia and in Namibia, where we take our local students, train them in the techniques that we've developed, teach them how to be able to apply them and use them themselves. So I've got a wonderful student I'm working with named Eileen right now in the same location. Here we are in Namibia in the desert mapping this threatened plant called Welwitchia mirabilis. It's a very special plant only found in Namibia, in the Namib Desert. And it's one of the world's oldest conifers. It doesn't look like a conifer. It has these big, long blades. This is a 3D model of it, a one plant. The blades are eaten by feral donkeys. Somebody introduced donkeys into the Namib Desert. But you can see there, those tendrils should be around 12 meters long, but they aren't. And so we've been helping them to capture the, the images. They've protected those particular plants so we can go back year after year after year and see how much they've grown and see how they've been impacted, if they have at all. So that's been very exciting research to be involved in. So here I'm coming towards the end of my, my talk. Um, and I wanted to just reflect on my journey with you as, as students and as PhD students. And really, how did I get to here from staring at space? Um, and it's been quite a journey, let me tell you that. One of the things I just want, a few bits of wisdom to impart. One, you can't connect those dots just looking forward. You have to think about and reflect on your past. Your past has a huge impact on who you are as an individual, who you are as a scientist, and, and the values that you bring to your research. And for me, that is what has driven me and encouraged me and supported me in my journey through my research. The other lesson I want to teach you about is we all make mistakes. And I've made lots of them. Um, my dad wanted me to be a doctor. I did pre-medicine. I spent four years of my life trying to, to go into that field. And I even took the MCATs in America, which are the exams that you take prior to going into medicine, and realized it wasn't for me. I really was on the wrong journey. Again, I went and did physiology of fish. I realized this isn't what I want to do for a career. I'm interested in pattern. I'm interested in satellites. I'm interested in remote sensing. So I went on my journey, and I just kept going on it. And that's it. We make mistakes. If we don't make those mistakes, we won't learn from them. It's important. It's a part of our journey, and it's a part of who we are. And the world is so much better off for those mistakes that we make. So enjoy them and, and embrace them. And finally, the most important thing I can ever impart in my wisdom is basically let go. Enjoy this ride. It may feel stressful at the time that you're doing your PhD, but it's actually a wonderful opportunity to experience and to dive into something that you're actually passionate about. Study your passion. Do something that really makes you feel good about yourself. Enjoy that whole process of your PhD. It's a unique opportunity, and it's a very special opportunity. I had a wonderful mentor helping me through my thesis, and I hope that I am that person for my students. I've had a lot of students go through, and it's been quite a journey. Some have been easy, some have not been easy. And I probably haven't been the easiest as well, but the process and the journey is what's important. And the passion for what you're doing. 
So keep it alive. Don't, don't get bogged down in the day-to-day -day mundane and stress and deadlines. <laughs> so that is um, my bits, pearls of wisdom. Um, what I also want to show you is about keeping that passion alive. I'm going to show you a clip that a student of mine did while he was studying um, whales in Tonga. He was actually doing some pre-work here in the Hauraki Gulf. We wrote a paper that just came out in scientific reports on using drones around marine mammals. And while they were doing their research, a British whale surfaced next to them. And because they had that passion and that energy and that enthusiasm, they said, let's film this. This is incredible. And what they filmed was the first instance of seeing British whales feed and lunge feed. And this was a few years ago, but that's what I loved about these students. They had the passion. They were there because they loved it. And they stopped for a moment, took a breath, and looked at the beauty in our natural world and acknowledged it and embraced it. And this clip that they did, which I'm going to show you now, has been seen all over the world. So I'm just going to ask you to embrace the beauty of it and enjoy it just for a minute. I love the words that Lorenzo used. It was a joy to see every time. And it still is. I still watch that and get tingles down my spine. It's special to stop and take a moment and actually enjoy the nature that we have around us. We're very blessed in this country. And that was just on our doorstep. So I just want to say a quick thank you to the team that I work with because I'm nothing without the people I work with. We all are the same, you know, the students, the staff, and everyone who has supported me throughout this journey of mine. And of course, my dad and my mom. My mom was the rock. <laughs> so looking out into the future, are there any questions? Thank you.